The measurements obtained in research studies provide the data for statistical analysis. Most statistical analyses use the same mathematical notation and basic arithmetic you learned in school. That said, there is some additional notation that's used for statistical calculations. It's useful to specify how many scores are in a data set. We use the uppercase letter N to represent the number of scores in a population and a lowercase n to represent the number of scores in a sample. Let's say the data in Table 2-1 are from a student clinic run by nursing and medical students. One of the licensed physicians who supervises the clinic would like to know how many non-diabetic, pre-diabetic and diabetic patients were screened during the past week. The next step would be for you to organise the scores into some comprehensible form so that any patterns in the data could be easily seen and communicated to the attending physician. This is the job of descriptive statistics, to simplify the organisation and presentation of data. One of the most common procedures for organising a set of data is to place the scores in a frequency distribution. Table 2.2 is a frequency distribution representing only part of the data in Table 2.1. A frequency distribution takes a disorganized set of scores and places them in order from highest to lowest, grouping together all the individuals who have the same score. A frequency distribution allows the researcher to see at a glance the entire set of scores. It shows whether the scores are generally high or low, whether they're concentrated in one area or spread out across the entire scale, and generally provides an organized picture of the data. The purpose for constructing a table is to obtain a relatively simple, organised picture of the data. This can be accomplished by grouping the scores into intervals, and then listing the intervals in the table instead of each individual score. The result is called a group frequency distribution table, and the groups are called class intervals. Table 2.3 has a class interval size of 20. Table 2.3 is much simpler, better organised and more easily understood than Table 2.2 and it's much better than Table 2.1. You've probably come across group frequency distributions already, perhaps without even realising it. When researchers summarise larger data sets with thousands or millions of numbers, they often distribute the relative frequency of scores rather than counts. A relative frequency describes the proportion of the data in each interval. It's often easier to list the relative frequency of scores because a list with very large counts in each interval can be more confusing to read. Table 2.4 summarises the entire set of data originally shown in Table 2.1. When researchers want to describe frequencies above or below a certain value, they often report a cumulative frequency distribution. A cumulative frequency distributes the sum of frequencies across a series of class intervals. We can sum the frequencies beginning with the bottom and adding up the table. Here we can see how to calculate the cumulative frequency. In Table 2.5, look at the column in the middle representing relative frequency. We begin with the frequency in the bottom interval, 44%. 44% plus 32% gives us a cumulative frequency of 76%. In order to get the next cumulative frequency, we add 44% plus 32% plus 16% to give us a cumulative frequency of 92. We keep doing this, adding up the table. 44 plus 32 plus 16 plus 0 0.5 gives us a cumulative frequency of 92.5. 44 plus 32 plus 16 plus 0.5 plus 0.5 gives us a cumulative frequency of 93. This is repeated until all the frequencies are summed. This type of summary is useful if we want to discuss data in terms of less than, or at or below a certain value, or at most. For example, people with normal blood sugar levels are those who report a fasting blood glucose less than 100 mg per deciliter. Table 2.6 shows frequency, relative and cumulative distribution tables in a more quick glance, summarised form. 
The patterns present in the Table 2-1 student clinic data are more readily comprehended and communicated to the supervising physician or nurse when they're organised using descriptive statistics into the form of Table 2-6. Even more than tables, graphs help us see our data at a glance. The most common methods for graphing data are the polygon, histogram, bar graph and pie chart. However, the type of graph that is appropriate to display a distribution depends on the scale of measurement used. Group data, which measure continuous variables on an interval or ratio scale, can be summarised graphically using the frequency polygon. This is a dot and line graph where the dot is the midpoint of each interval and the line connects each dot. A dot and line graph can also be used to summarise cumulative percents. This type of graph, called a cumulative frequency polygon, is used for continuous data. Another graph that can be used to summarise group data that is continuous and measured on an interval or ratio scale is the histogram. Histograms distribute the intervals along the horizontal, or x-axis, and list the frequency of scores in each interval on the vertical, or y-axis. A histogram and a frequency polygon are equally effective at summarising their particular types of data. The choice between which of the two to use comes down to personal preference. Bar graphs are much like histograms, except that the rectangular bars are separated from one another, while those in histograms touch. The separation between bars reflects the separation or break between the whole numbers or categories being summarised. For this reason, bar graphs are appropriate for distributions of discrete interval or ratio data, as well as data measured on a nominal or ordinal scale. The pie chart is another graphical summary used almost exclusively for discrete or nominal and ordinal data. To construct a pie chart, we typically distribute data as relative percents. Converting a distribution to a pie chart is simply a matter of finding the correct angles for each slice of pie. Rather than drawing a complete frequency distribution graph, researchers often simply describe its characteristics. There are three characteristics that completely describe any distribution. Shape, central tendency, and variability. Think of it another way. When you're calling a pizza place, there's really only three things that you need to describe to the person on the other end of the phone. The size of the pizza, the type of crust or base, and the toppings. In this module, we'll provide you with the language that describes data in terms of shape. The shape of a distribution provides distinctive information. Let's take a sample of 10 individuals, have them take an IQ test, then graph the data with a histogram. Look at the overall shape. Most scores are close to 100, with a few people scoring below or above this. Let's increase the sample size to 20 individuals. Look at the overall shape in this histogram. Again, the highest frequency value is close to 100, with fewer people above or below. Let's increase the sample size to 60. Again, it's big in the middle, with fewer scores at either side. As the sample size increases, here we have n of 100, the more triangular or pyramid shape the frequency distribution becomes. Here's n of 1,000, and here's an n of 10,000. Increasing the sample size until it gets closer and closer to something like a large population, the more the distribution exhibits this shape. If we could give a population of infinite size an IQ test and graph the data, it would look like this. This is called a normal distribution. It's also sometimes called a Gaussian or bell-shaped distribution. Statisticians use the word normal to describe this particular shape of distribution. It's symmetrical, with the greatest frequency in the middle and relatively smaller frequencies as you move towards either extreme. The normal distribution occurs in most but not all research situations. Reality is not always normally distributed, which means that the distributions describing those particular observations are not shaped normally. So we need a new term to help us describe such distributions. Skew. In a symmetrical distribution, it's possible to draw a vertical line through the middle 
so that half of all scores fall above the line and half fall below. Unlike the normal distribution which is symmetrical, skewed data have an ever thinning tail in one direction or the other. So a skewed distribution is a distribution in which one of the tails is pulled away from the centre. When a distribution is positively skewed, the tail extends to the right in a positive direction. In other words, away from the zero point where the x and y axes usually meet. Negatively skewed data have a distribution with a tail that extends to the left in a negative direction. The way to remember the difference is to pay attention to the tail. If it's extending towards zero, and therefore the negative side of the x-axis, the distribution has a negative skew. If the tail is extending away from zero, and therefore towards the positive side of the x-axis, the skew is positive. In a similar way to the concept of skewedness, kurtosis is a descriptor of the shape of a distribution. Kurtosis measures and describes the peakness of a frequency distribution. A mesocurtic distribution is the same as the normal distribution. Leptocurtic distributions have more kurtosis, more peakness. They're thinner and more pointy. Platycurtic distributions have less kurtosis, or less peakness. They're broader and flatter. Although the primary purpose of a frequency distribution is to provide a description of an entire set of scores, it can also be used to describe the position of an individual within the set. By themselves, raw scores don't provide much information about their position in the overall data distribution. Because of this, they're usually transformed into a more meaningful form. One transformation that we will consider changes raw scores into percentiles. If you're told that your score in an exam is 43, you can't tell how well you did compared to your classmates. To evaluate your score like this, you need more information, such as the average score in the test, or the number of people who had scores above and below you. With this additional information, you would be able to determine your relative position in the class. The rank or percentile rank of a particular score is defined as the percentage of individuals in the distribution with scores at or below that particular value. When a score is identified by its percentile rank, the score is called a percentile. Notice that percentile rank refers to a percentage and that percentile refers to a score. That sounds kind of confusing, right? Let me try and clarify. Percent rank and percentile are like two sides of the same coin. They're two descriptions of the same thing, which is the exact position of an individual score within the distribution. For example, I ran in the very first Geist Half Marathon near Fishers, Indiana. My friend Jane actually won the women's competition with a time of 1 hour and 23 minutes. That's me in the middle, runner 1186. This is Jane, giving that ice cream cone big licks. Over 4,000 people registered, but only 2,766 finished. It was easy for Jane to know her position in the overall race. She won. But what about me? I came in at 1 hour and 48 minutes, 823rd. My time of 1 hour and 48 minutes and my rank of 823 are linked together. They describe my position in the overall race. Like I said before, they're like two sides of the same coin. Compared to all 2,766 runners, the moment that I cross the finish line, that specific moment, can be described by my time and my rank. 823rd isn't easy for most people to get their heads around. It's better to convert that into a percentage. Let's say I was in the 80th percentile. 80% 80 of the runners had a score of 1 hour and 48 minutes, or slower. 1 hour and 48 minutes is my position as a score, while 80% is my position as a percentage. The cumulative frequency polygon and cumulative frequency distribution both illustrate the concept of percent rank, which states the percentage of scores that fall below any particular value. 
Percent ranks provide a way of giving information about one individual score in relation to all the others in a distribution. For example, say a person from the student run clinic with a fasting blood glucose level of 210 mg per deciliter lies at the 95th percentile. Roughly 5% of the scores in the sample are higher than this. Percentile ranks are one member of a family of values called quantiles, which divide distributions into an equal number of parts. Percentiles, or sometimes just called centiles, they divide into 100 equal parts. Quartiles divide into 4 equal parts. Quintiles divide into 5, and deciles divide into 10. Transforming a baby's height, weight and head circumference information into percentiles allows paediatricians and paediatric nurses to monitor the health of infants. These percentile descriptive statistics enable nursing staff and physicians to compare a child with its past percentile measurements as well as the overall infant population.